Uh, thank you um, for the kind introduction. Um, I've been posed the question, are we on the crest of a new wave, sorry, a new wave in legume development in Queensland? Okay, legumes, we're all aware that they're a very diverse group of um, plants. We're looking at three core families of plants that are used by humans. Um, we're dealing with small plants, uh, small herbaceous plants through to long-lived trees. And of course, many of these plants are useful. Uh, this family is not unique, but it has the capacity of many, many of members to fix atmospheric nitrogen. As a result, many, pl many plants are quite high in protein, and this becomes quite useful for um, ruminants and monogastrics. Now, humans are some of those monogastrics. Uh, we've been chewing and we've been enjoying legumes for some 10,000 years in some parts of the, of the world. We also use them for crop rotation, um, producing um, oils, dyes, and gums, and so on. Of course, legumes, you all know, have an important role in, in, in livestock production. In the temperate parts of the world, um, we've been harnessing legumes for some 5,000 years. Uh, it's a shorter story in the tropics where we've really only been looking at these plants for the last 100 or so years. But in contrast to the temperate part of the world, we tend to use a much wider range of types and forms. We use plants from the Fabaceae, the pea, pea flower types, the older legume family, the Sacerpaneaceae, and also from the Mimosaceae, so that's plants like Desmanthus and Leucina and so on. Most of the um, legumes that we use uh, in Australia come from South America, um, and they're characterised by being undomesticated. Most of these plants have simply been plucked out of their growing environments. Um, there's been some basic selection in Australia, um, but we're really using wild-type plants. Okay, so why do we put um, legumes into pastures? Gavin's already been talking about some of those reasons. Um, ultimately, it's about improving feed intake and digestibility of feed. And we know from Gavin's talk that there are, there are some prime limitations in grass-only pastures. Of course, we can use that nitrogen that gets harnessed, use that in our production system, and by virtue of having tap roots, many of our legumes can grow well into the dry season. Um, this can produce high quality feed for longer into the year, and that's particularly important up in, North, in northern Australia. Um, the protein that comes with legumes can be used for improving rumen function. This in turn increases feed intake, and ultimately you're getting an increased supply of metabolizable energy and protein to the intestines for animal growth. We can also harness that nitrogen, bring it into the system, and use it for our grass production. So in Queensland, we, um, the beef industry is of prime importance. At, at last count, it's roughly worth about $3.2 um, million at the farm gate, or 28% of the value of primary industries in the state. So it's a significant um, part of our, part of our um, economy. It's fundamentally based on natural, gra uh, natural grasslands, some 170 million hectares in a range of communities based on different rainfall and soil, type, soil types. That's complemented along the, sorry, that's complemented along the coastal strip by sown grasses, and of course, Gavin's been talking about some of the important areas of sown grasses in central Queensland. Ultimately, the goal of, of using um, pasture legumes, of course, is to increase our live weight gain, to uh, achieve younger turnoff and improve reproductive performance of breeders. And in 1990, when it was reviewed, it was roughly estimated that about 41 million hectares could possibly be used for sown pastures. Now, Australia was part of a world first and a very brave experiment in transforming our landscape into a more intensive pasture base. This happened in the post-World War II period. It involved research teams from CSIRO, the State Departments of Agriculture, universities and so on, working with grazing industries, undertaking broad-scale plant evaluation and development projects. Um, it involved collecting material from around the world, um, introducing that into the country, and the formation of the Tropical Forages Germplasm Bank. Um, that's been our key resource for developing plants now um, for some 30 years, and at its height that contained about 26,000 different kinds of grasses and legumes. We had small-scale um, seed increase, which was undertaken by the CSIRO and the Department of Primary Industries, and extensive field testing of different plants under grazing situations at a wide range of networks of sites throughout the state. Broad-scale seed production was undertaken mainly by the Queensland Government in North Queensland, 
And we also saw the development of the seed industry on the Atherton Tablelands. And importantly, there was a structured approach to releasing these plants. It was based on scientific evidence, um, and it was overseen by NAPIC, which was the North Australian Pasture Plant Evaluation Committee. Now, this comprised CSIRO, state governments, universities and seed companies, forming a, co a, compre a comprehensive and compelling cultivar release case. After the plants had been released, more research was undertaken to refine grazing and pasture management, seed crop agronomy, and at the time we were producing world-leading publications which came through the Tropical Grassland Society. It was a really productive time. By the end of that period, we had produced about 130 different kinds of grasses and legumes, including legumes for permanent pastures, grazing lays and green manures. And in particular, we had a lot of plants, sorry, for this zone here. We've relatively few with this zone here, but we still had a few holes in our arsenal over here. Um, we still had a few issues with some of our older, um, our, our more interesting legumes. Um, nitrogen fixation was an issue in some. We were always concerned about anthracnose becoming a problem in stylosanthes, and psyllid damage to leukina was limiting, limiting the adoption of that particular plant. Come the 1990s and 2000s, we saw a massive wind down in the capacity of the federal and state governments um, to undertake pasture research. We saw the disbanding of NAPAC. We saw the uncertainty over the tropical forages collection. We saw the ending of the Tropical Grassland Society. And we saw the retirement of many of our eminent scientists and technical staff. And we had an emergency period of information capture where we tried to collect as much information as we could before it was lost forever. So how do we handle it today? Well, we're dealing in a, a situation where we are resource poor, and we've had to try to remain momentum in developing legumes and grasses um, over the last um, 10 or so years. We've seen greater involvement by universities and seed companies in identifying and developing new plants. And the North Queensland Government um, Seed Production Facility has continued to act as a hub, providing seed for plant evaluation programs and commercial adoption. We've also been relifing some of our older varieties, and Gavin touched on that a bit earlier. And when we've had the money, we've tried to regenerate um, uh, plants within the Australian Tropical Forages Collection. <clears throat> that Tropical Forages Collection remains a core resource for developing new pasture plants. CSRO used it to develop, whoopsie, it's done the wrong thing. Um, to develop lay legumes for this zone, as did many seed companies. We've also seen the Queensland Government developing plants within this zone here, and there have been a few additions to that suite of plants that we have on the, on the wet coastal strip. Another approach that we've had to use is to identify plants from overseas that have been developed overseas and bring those into the country. And a prime example are the anthracnose-resistant stylos um, that we brought in about five years ago, and these are now broadly available commercially. At the same time, we took the opportunity to bring in a number of high-quality grasses as well. An approach that um, Gavin has touched on is the selection of plants from old plant evaluation sites. Um, that's been used um, to look at stylos, stylos in this part of Queensland, and Chris Gardner will be speaking a little bit about selecting Desmanthus for this part of Queensland. Uh, there are a few notable independent breeding and selection programs which have been going on, and a key one has been the Lucina Development Project in, um, undertaken at University of Queensland under Max Shelton to develop um, uh, inter-specific hybrids which have good psyllid resistance. So I guess the question was, are we on a new wave? Well, we are developing new legume varieties, but they're mostly meeting the priority areas, and they are mostly meeting the priority areas developed in the 1990s. We're looking at pasture legumes for um, the moderate rainfall areas of the state. We're trying to um, look at diseases and stylos, psyllids and leukinas, and there's been quite a lot of work in developing um, crop grazing systems, especially for southern and central Queensland. There's also, as um, Gavin touched on, been a bit of work refining some of the management of some of the key legumes that we have. Um, good news in recent times, MLA has joined the party again. Um, they're beginning to reinvest 
in some of these projects. There's Gavin's project looking for stylos for light textured soils. They've been investing in the um, Lucina project. And over the next five years, the, um, the DAF team, um, research and extension teams, will be evaluating a range of promising legumes across northern, um, northern Queensland. Uh, CSRO will also be undertaking a research stock take where they hope to identify areas um, of promising research into the future. Other good news in recent times, uh, we have uh, renewed funding for the relife of the Tropical Forages collection. This will see the collection moving from Queensland to Adelaide, but, but it will also see the regeneration and description of that material in North Queensland by the DAF team. And that should allow us to identify some promising legumes for the future. So is it a new wave? Well, it is new work, but I think a lot of it's been based on the previous efforts of those who've gone before us. In general, we're dealing with the same genera, same species. We're building on that work that has happened previously, and we're using the resources that were available at the time. Um, we're developed over the time. So old plant evaluation sites, information, and importantly, those aging brains of those scientists who've gone before us. And there is some new blood. We have some some um, really keen researchers and extension staff learning off some of those older, wider, wiser heads, and we're finding now that the funding situation is beginning to um, improve. So is it a new wave? Well, I think maybe not, but is it a new beginning? Well, I hope so.